It's my pleasure to welcome today's panelists and our online audience at our press conference entitled The New Agenda on Food, launching a decade of action at the World Economic Forum 2020, the 50th annual meeting. Today, I'm joined by Shonda Klein, member of the executive committee at the World Economic Forum, Gilbert Houbon, president of the International Fund of Agriculture and Development, Hanneke Feber, president of Food and Refreshment at Unilever, Johan Rockström, director of Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, AJ Jakar, chairman of Bharat Krishga Jamaj, and he will correct the proper pronunciation of that institution, uh, and Weber Dreyer, chairman of the managing board of Rabobank. Welcome, everyone. We're here because an urgent call has been made by the UN Secretary General. Um, he called this the decade of action to deliver on the SDGs. And today is uh, quite an epic day for the World Economic Forum. It's the first uh, day that we're having an all vegetarian menu um, for all sessions during the, at the Congress Center and at the Media Center. So food has been on the agenda and on our plate for the day. So we're very excited to be discussing on this very important topic. So I'll, Sean, I turn to you to ask us, uh, how can we deliver on this urgent call? What is the World Economic Forum doing? Thank you, Alan. So, I mean, food systems are universal. Everyone must eat. Uh, and, uh, and because people interact with food every day, actions to transform the underlying system are full of opportunities to drive progress towards a more prosperous, healthy, and sustainable world. But it also speaks to the heart of the sustainable development goals. But what is urgently needed is to work out how we move away from simply a model of food production which produces as much food as possible, as cheaply as possible, simply based on taste and how it looks, to a food supply that is healthier to all of us as humans, that is more sustainable for the planet, and it also improves the lives, particularly of those in rural areas. And so unless we do this, food security will continue to rise. Diet-related costs will become insurmountable. And the impact on our natural world, its water supply, the destruction of forests and nature loss will add to the climate and environmental crisis that we currently face. And so in a way, we've, we have to see, as in other sectors where we've seen a transition we need in food to see a, a transition to a healthier, more sustainable, more efficient, more inclusive food system. And a major challenge is working out who is going to pay for this transition. I mean, farmers alone cannot bear the cost. And there is also a limit to how much consumers can be expected to pay. And similarly, we're seeing, as we have with investment funds that, and pension funds looking to step away from fossil fuels, we need them to invest in sustainable food supplies. And governments must become a lot smarter in using subsidies to promote this move to more sustainable food sources and to encourage a healthier way in which we eat. And so, and companies and also must look at their entire supply chains to, to move towards as much more sustainable sourcing of foods as possible. The UN Secretary General has actually called this the, the decade of delivery. Uh, to deliver the Sustainable Development Goals, including through the recent announcement of the UN Food System Summit in 2021, with the intention of offering a catalytic moment for actionable commitments and public mobilisation. And so we're here today to present some of those key initiatives that will support food system transition towards those Sustainable Development Goals. This includes the launching of the incentivising of the food system trans transformation report that has just come out, which outlines four pathways for incentivizing food system transition and presents a roadmap for change. The announcement of the Food Systems Economics Commission, whose overarching objective is to further transition to healthy, inclusive and sustainable food systems by providing a comprehensive assessment of the economics of the current food systems and their unaccounted for costs and to fairly distribute its impacts of the transition. And finally, the 
Food Action Alliance, a next generation of coalition of a large number of organisations and initiatives to support country level action that promotes food system transformation. Thank you, Sean. I'm going to skip in above all of these wonderful panelists and go straight to Gilbert and ask him um, how, um, how it, as Sean said, food is key, it's crucial to everyone. And food cuts across all the SDG goals. So how can the, the UN priorities focus on this? And how are they trying to achieve that? Uh, uh, thank you so much. One of the um, key reasons why the um, SDG decided to launch this call for action um, comes from the, the, the fact that, as we know very well, all 17 um, SDGs are really interrelated. And it, it Frankly speaking, it will be um, a tactical and strategic mistake to just try to focus on one SDG or two SDGs and not looking at the others. This is really, that's why the, at the UN level, we want to promote all at the same time. That being said, we also know that the SDG 2 is one of those SDGs that are lagging behind. This is really why it's important for us to really have a specific um, um, initiative um, for the SDG 2. We know very well that when you talk about the food, we talk about water, and therefore you talk about climate, you talk about gender, because they are the, 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 is that the women are at the, the front line in the production. Um, we talk about um, the voice, and therefore SDG um, 16, you talk about the health, uh, SDG um, um, 4, you talk about education, all um, starting with SDG, uh, SDG 1. Um, so my point is that by pushing and focusing on um, the food, not only are you going to address the SDG 2 itself in terms of food security, but when you unpack all the, uh, the, the metrics of SDG 2, you realize how you have a direct impact on the others. Um, I would give you one specific example. If you take SDG 2.3, the target 2.3, it's talking about doubling the productivity and the income of the smallholders, so you're not just making sure that they are food secure on, 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 on that. So it's going to be um, um, crucial. My last point I want to, at this stage, is to come back to what uh, Sean was, uh, um, was, uh, was, was saying. Um, if we really want to make a decisive impact on the SDGs, we need to see how we are oriented or taking action-related initiative. Um, we need to fix the policies, There's a, we need to coordinate, we need to work in partnership, but working the work, not just talking the talk. So we really need to look at actions, action that in moving us uh, forward. I believe that one of those action is the special envoy that you just announced. Yeah, the special, uh, the, the, the special envoy that the uh, SDG has uh, announced, uh, uh, Agnes Kalibata, she's an uh, agriculture scientist, uh, president of the Africa Green Revolution um, Alliance based in, uh, in, uh, in Nairobi. And some have, uh, have seen her how um, uh, full of energy and passion and determined to push this agenda forward. What we want to, we're going to go forward with, the, uh, with this uh, system um, um, summit is to bring all the stakeholders together. It's not just the UN. It's not just the uh, international financial institution. It's not just the private sector. It's not just the foundation, the civil society, the academia. It's all of us. And I have to say, though, we know that the gap in this financing is huge. You talk about billions, hundreds of billions a year, if um, today if we were to achieve the SDG 2. But we need to look at beyond the financing. There are so much we could do, and this is what we expect from all of us. And this is a perfect transition to Haneke. We just launched a, a report looking at how there's four pathways that we can use as mechanism to incentivize um, a food system transformation. Can you share some of the key findings of that report? Yeah, absolutely. So we're actually, as, as Unilever and I think the private sector, pretty excited about this report. So it's called Incentivizing Food Systems Transformations. Obviously, 
a really big and important topic for all of us. And what we like about it is quite action oriented. So it has four action pathways of things we actually need to do together with all stakeholders. So the first one's about policy and it's about repurposing um, existing agricultural subsidies in different ways. So we grow more of a variety of crops for a more balanced diet, um, but also support farmers in a transition that will no doubt be painful. Um, so that's a really critical underlying piece in terms of policy. The second piece is about innovation. Um, you know, we need to prioritize environmental and social as well as financial outcomes in the innovation that we all do. Um, and to that end at Unilever, we've just opened a brand new um, innovation center, 85 million euro innovation center on the campus of Wageningen University in the Netherlands, which is the number one agri tech university in the world. And we want to be there so we can work with academia, with students, with professors, with startups, with scale ups that are also on campus to really open up our innovation to beyond just for financial gain, but also for social and environmental gain. So that's the second pathway. The third one is about institutional investments. Um, and, and the report calls for setting higher standards when it comes to institutional investments. Um, at Unilever, again, we're a big fan of this. Um, we uh, just last month in December, we, we were the first big company to host a um, sustainability event for investors. Um, and that was really well received. Um, we're also quite proud to be ranked number one in FAIR, which is an investor network uh, on the protein transition readiness of the company. Um, again, for investors to look at their institutional investment differently from only financial is really critical and the report calls that out. And then finally, consumer behavior change is the last pathway and of course, you know, that's what we're all about at Unilever. So business is going to have to play a pivotal role to make sure that consumers demand um, better products that are better for their health and better for the planet. Um, and we're doing that with more plant-based products, whether that's, you know, vegan mayonnaise with Hellman's or vegan Magnums or dairy-free Ben & Jerry's, which are all delicious, um, or with the vegetarian butcher, which offers phenomenal vegetarian burgers at Burger King, um, but also um, through projects like Knorr's Future 50, which encourages um, consumers and farmers to eat and grow more than just the five, six crops we all eat and grow, but actually encourage and motivate them to eat 50 different crops, crops we've long forgotten. And as a big brand, we can really make behavior change there, we believe. So those are the four pathways. We're excited about them. Uh, policy, innovation, investment, and consumer behavior. Um, now we just need to take action together, as Gilbert said. <laughs> Johan, you've also undertaken um, another path towards action, which is the Food System Economic Commission. Can you share some of the objective of that commission? Yeah, sure. Let me give you the scientific justification, not only behind the Food Economics Commission, but also why this action is so tremendously important. I mean, we're all preoccupied when we meet her in Davos of the big geopolitical turbulence in the world. We talk about war and terrorism, and we talk about phasing out fossil fuels and industry in particular and transport systems. We rarely talk about the fact that food is the single largest threat to people and planet. Three independent studies last year were published independently showing that 11 million people per year die prematurely because of not eating the kind of healthy food that Haneke was referring to here, due to obesity, due to malnourishment, due to diabetes, due to cardiovascular disease, due to too high levels of sodium, too much starchy food, the whole trend line towards overconsumption of animal-based uh, proteins and processed food. But at the same time, in the Eat Lancet Commission, for the first time, we took the food analysis scientifically to the planetary level, showing that food is a single cause behind transgressing five of the planetary boundaries. So if you want to know why we need to gather in Kunmin in China later this year to resolve the fact that we're in the fifth mass extinction of losing nature, food. The reason why we're overconsuming water, food. Why we have the single largest cause of deforestation and losing carbon sinks in climate, it's food. Why are we eutrophying our 
aquatic ecosystems. It's food. We have a broken food system. I mean, one should recognize that, you know, we, we cultivate protein in one part of the world by cutting down forests and losing nature, transport it over across oceans to produce meat in industries, then we consume it and cause health problems and eutrophy coastal zones downstream. It's a linear production system which is destroying humans and the planet. Now the drama here is that the Food and Land Use Coalition that is part of the partnership here assessed last year that the food system is worth on the market roughly 12 trillion US dollars. But the externalities of everything I've just shared with you cost, no sorry, the, the, yeah, the externalities is over, over that amount. So food is actually subsidized by the planet and by humans at a value which is higher than the market value. This requires us to now internalize all those costs so that we can get a correction of this mega market failure. We haven't done this. We talk so much about pricing carbon, we never talk about pricing food and the parts of the food system that are broken so that we can get the right incentives for farmers and for the value chain across from, from fork to field or field to fork. Now the Food Economics Commission will gather the leading economics academics in the world to do a stern review on the food system and to assess the costs of inaction if we continue as today. And the indications are already, we know this, that we will fail on both the sustainable development goals and on the Paris Climate Agreement just on continuing on food on its own. I mean, I just, let me repeat that, that even if we successfully decarbonize the whole energy system and get rid of all oil, all coal, all natural gas, we'll probably anyway pass the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold because food in itself is driving so much of the global warming and we'll certainly miss on the SDGs. We will put economic value on this. We have appointed the chairs leading economists in the world, Ravi Kambor and Professor Ottmar Edenhofer. They will be backed up by a leading international group of economists and we are kind of soft launching it here and taking this off. It's a partnership between the Food and Land Use Coalition, between Systemic and EAT and the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research. And um, in two years time, in conjunction with the Food Summit in 2021, that's less than two years I realize, we will be presenting the first global assessment from the Food Economics Commission. Thank you. AJ, none of this transformation can be achieved without farmers. What role do they need to play? I think it's uh, generally agreed uh, in the world today that the way farm subsidies and support systems and mechanisms have been designed and how money is being spent is not only not sustainable, it's also harming the environment. And a transformation of incentives is required. Now, everybody understands that it's required. Everybody also understands that if you do not transform, as you've just told us, it's going to be very bad. So uh, it's, it, there, there is a realization. But at the same time, the biggest resistance to this food systems transformation can come from the farmers themselves because they f fear that a transformation may lead to lesser profits for them. Uh, and, and that's why platforms like the World Economic Forum, where we are sitting together, are become necessary so we can all sit together, design, take farmers into confidence, take everybody into confidence, and design a transformation which is not just about food, as everyone's talking about, but about farmer livelihood, satisfy, satisfying livelihoods. And I think so, satisfying livelihoods is captured in the report by saying inclusive, li inclusive. I think so, inclusive includes satisfying livelihoods. Till farmers do not have satisfying livelihoods, a transformation itself is is not going to be possible, and uh, this is this this opportunity of working together under different alliances into into a summit that's coming in two years. I think so. It's a great opportunity to get farmers from all countries on board, take their opinion, and I think so. This is exactly what's happening, and this is what's planned. So it's it's great to be here. Wonderful, Hubert. Yeah. How are we going to pay for all of this? Gilbert talked about billions. Everyone has talked about the money. Um, as the finance partner, what are the mechanisms that needs to be put in place to achieve this transformation? 
Yeah, thank you for that question. And uh, usually when it gets to this question, they, they turn to a bank. <laughs> and I'm glad to be a bank in this in this world of food that um, that on the one hand fully, fully needs this call and this alarm uh, bell ranging of inaction. I think that's an important analysis to do. At the same time, there's also very optimistic analysis done by the FOLU and by the Eat Lancet report that says that if we do act, it's not only avoiding disaster, it is actually also creating value. Uh, it's creating uh, a better livelihood for farmers and it's creating lots of uh, benefits and more healthy diets. So it's actually an important thing to do. And the truth is also that there is an enormous amount of money available uh, but it's very hard to get it moved from the money that's available to the investments that are needed to take place. And so what, uh, there are a couple of things that are needed from the financing world. It's both the redirection of subsidies. It's going to be finding new blended solutions where you combine different types of money so that it matches the need of the investments. And you need to find ways of um, ensuring or supporting the transition of farmers in the, in the phase that they transition. And so one of the things that we as a bank, and Rao Bank, and Rao Bank is all over the world in the food supply chain, is created a fund, the Agri3 fund. And in that fund you have um, the United Nations environment uh, participating, but also governments uh, funding this fund. And what the fund does, it, it helps farmers to make the shift to more sustainable practices. Literally on the face in Brazil, for example, that you build an incentive through this funding and this financing that they do not use uh, practices that chop down forests, but they limit their uh, land use. So financing is, on the one hand, is a matter of making sure that money gets to the proper places where you can invest, but at the same time creating incentives, the pathways, so that farmers can make the shift, consumers can make the shift. And in one of the areas in which we as a bank are also participating is in the Food Action Alliance. And there are a lot of the stakeholders here at the table are participating in country or regional programs aimed at creating that on the ground where the farmers are involved, the, um, the, the, the multilateral uh, organizations are involved, and banks are involved to finance the shift. And only if we organize as a system around that will we make the change that is needed. And so one thing I wanted to close with is, you will hear much in this, this day of food is about system change. And what it actually is, is it, what it takes is that whole ways of uh, patterns of producing and eating need to shift. And the only way to do that is by combining the forces that you see behind the table here, calling for action, but also acting uh, in congruence, like in the, f um, the, uh, the Food Action Alliance that we uh, have formed. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, I know we have a few minutes left um, for questions, so I'm going to open up the floor if you can keep it succinct, and we might actually group them so that uh, we can make sure that our panelists can get to their next session. If you can state your name and your media outlet. Job Wout, Financiële Dagblad, Financial Daily. A question for uh, Hanneke and uh, Wieber, of course. Um, in your and my peaceful country, uh, there was a lot of far farmer protest last year. On, uh, it was all about climate policy of our government and the future, future of our farmers. And what went wrong, in your opinion, uh, in this peaceful country? And more specific, should, should policy makers, what should policy makers do to, to deal and to address this farmer uproar? Okay. And we're going to just see if there's any other questions. Okay, fantastic. So uh, thank you for asking that, uh, because I think it's also a good example to see that this transformation in the food supply to the world is not something where we focus, for example, focus on, a on Asia, India, or Africa, South America. It happens in Europe, in North America. And what the issue that you're addressing here is, is unrest among farmers. The farmers are feeling more and more, let's say, the, the last piece of the equation, the, the victim of the transition that is lies ahead. And I think as, as uh, also was... Um, as AJ also indicated, is that we need to put the farmer back in the f uh, entrepreneurial seat, fi creating a pathway in which he or she is the, is the success of the transition that lies ahead, that they are the leader of the transition. And I think one of the things that went wrong, if you want to use that word, uh, in the Netherlands, and we had uproar of farmers in the street, is that they, they felt uh, without space to move. And so one of the challenges that we face in Europe, uh, in the Netherlands in particular, a successful country when it comes to agriculture, is how to make the transition possible that we all want, while we create space for the farmer to be successful through it. This is highly possible. It's just that we need to put the stakeholders around the table and think about solutions that help them make the shift. And we are starting to do that, and you see that they act positively to it. 
Uh, but we do need to find a way of making the transition that is needed in food something in which the farmer, it's farm, needs to be farmer-centric in a way so that the farmer can make the shift uh, on the farm level in the Netherlands, in Germany, in India, in Africa, in South America, and in North America, everywhere around the world. The farmer is a key ingredient in that change. And thank you for asking the question. AJ? Yeah. <coughs> I, what, what must, I think so, there's another amazing part of this whole discussion that we're having is that whether it be the Economic Commission, whether it be the summit in 2000, 21, whether it be the Food Action Alliances, that all these thought processes are coming when international commodity prices are low. Normally, you would expect such coalitions and such conversations to happen when there was high infl food inflation and food stocks were low. So it, it's, it's, it's a time, I think so, this is how you preempt the future and, and try and, and reverse what's happening. And the, I think so the timing is absolutely crucial and outstanding that we're doing it when, when there is no demand for it. But we are foreseeing what's happening, and, and this, is, this is an important part, I think. Yeah, I, I just want to echo what, what Reba said. I mean, we, we talk a lot, obviously, about feeding Africa uh, and the developing world, but this transition of the food system is going to be extremely painful in Europe and the U.S. as well, and, and the recent events in Holland showed that. I, I think what we need to do better in the future is to really have farmers at the table. No one invests more in farming than the farmers themselves. Um, but they also want to be part of designing the future and the transition. And, and that clearly, I think, was not well done. So we can learn from that. I think the other thing is in Europe's Green Deal, um, it will be critical that subsidies are repurposed and additional incentives are created during the transition, especially for farmers, or this thing won't fly. John? Yeah, so, so, I mean, I, I totally agree that we need to include farmers, and I think this is fundamental to succeed. But I also think there's quite a lot of evidence to say that we are doing a fundamental mistake if we believe that the way forward is to just adapt to every uprising we get on this kind of complaint over moving from inertia towards a new direction. Because we know that the uprising in France with the Gilets jaunes, we know that what happened on the streets in Germany a few weeks ago on farmers' uprisings and in the Netherlands is simply because we are unable to go in with policy reforms in one area without having socially thought through pathways in another area. And we know now that we can do you know, redistribution of wealth. You can, you can actually increase tax here, but reduce income taxes. You can subsidize in different ways. I mean, everyone complains of the European cap system, the common agricultural policy. Well, my God, everyone complains because of 40% of the European budget. But isn't that a lot of money you can spend on farmers? I mean, that's amazing. What, what's the impact of that uh, in, uh, investment? Well, it's that food is so cheap. That's what has happened. Food is so cheap in the world, it's cheaper than it has ever been. The average income level of households put on food today is less than 10% on average. Go 40 years back, it was over 30%. You know, people do not put money on food today. So, and I'm not saying that uh, science suggests that we just have to increase food prices, but we have to somehow get, uh, get to smart new mechanisms where we can help low income, both farmers and households, to, to kind of uh, compensate for the fact that we need to somehow get a recalibration. We cannot just destroy the planet to have cheap food and then get scared every time someone complains. As very evident by this uh, incredible and robust conversation, this is a conversation that needs to continue. And this is a conversation that cannot happen in silos. So I thank today's panelists for joining us and our audience online and in the room. Thank you very much. Good night.